Hey guys, back again with another ARC review on time. Can you believe it? Because I can't. Um, <laughs> so the book that I am talking about today, the fact that I have not seen it advertised in every single way as Project Runway meets Lizzie McGuire movie is I think a marketing fail on their point because that's what this book is. Like a perfect harmony of those two things. <laughs> and for me, that would be a huge selling point. So if you want to know in a nutshell what the concept of the book we're talking about today is, Project Runway meets the Lizzie McGuire movie. That's it. So the book in question that we're talking about is Chow for Now by Kate Bromley. I reviewed one of Kate Bromley's books a while ago now. That one was called Talk Bookish to Me. And this book was really interesting because it did something very unique in the ending, trying to give a little bit more depth and space to the characters' relationships in a way that sometimes, you know, after the big fight or the big thing that happens, like, I sometimes feel like romance novels kind of forgive and forget too easily. And there was something really, really interesting in Talk Bookish to me where Kate Bromley tried to like get around that in the space of one book. I don't think that it was done perfectly, but it made me really, really interested to read what this author would come up with next. This is not the direct next book. This is now her third book, but still really interested in that. So Chow for Now is the story of Violet, who is a 29-year-old college student finishing up a degree in fashion design. Now, I said 29, and that wasn't a mistake. Violet kind of, when she started in fashion school, kind of gave up on that dream when she was 20 to follow a romantic partner to Chicago, and she wasn't able to continue that fashion dream. She broke up with that partner, and now she is back as an older, you know, fashion school student, older than most of her peers, trying to finish the degree that she started all that time ago. She has been chosen with two other fashion school peers to do a one month internship in Rome, Italy, basically competing in this uh, competition that's hosted by their school where they choose the top three, send them to Italy for a month where they work and learn at this fashion school um, or fashion design house and then they bring them back, they do a final collection, and the winner of all of that gets their a job and their collection made with a fashion design house based in New York City. So Project Runway, ahoy! <laughs> Violet has a lot of confidence issues, but she really loves fashion, specifically her um, two top priorities of design wear are evening and lingerie. And because of the lingerie thing, she has, again, a lot of self-doubt. That's not necessarily something that uh, many people around her are really supporting. But, you know, she's like, you know, I, I got up the gumption to go back to school, even though I thought I was too old to continue this dream. Like, I have a dream for a collection that I just really want to support. And she gets chosen to go to Italy, and she's like, yeah, I'm going to win it all. <laughs> On the day that she arrives in Rome, she has an absolutely disastrous moment in a Roman cafe where she knocks into somebody who is there working on their laptop and drinking coffee and she not only spills his coffee all over him but she also breaks his laptop in half. Like it's bad. It's a total disaster and Violet being a people pleaser, freaking out, tries to make it up to him by buying him a coffee and offering to pay for his laptop and all this kind of stuff. And this guy is very handsome. He's from New York City as well. And after a few moments of like, oh, I can't believe this happened, they end up having, I wouldn't say a pleasant conversation, but a very, the sparks are flying conversation in the cafe as they wait for the waiter to bring his apology coffee. This scene may be the most unbelievable in this entire book, and here is why. You find out later that this gentleman, Matt, is a writer. He was working on writing for a TV show that he works on, and he did not have a backup file of the work that he was working on that is now gone because the laptop is totally, completely damaged. The fact that he 
forgives Violet, like, in that moment. And, like, forgives her, but is, like, able to have, like, a cogent conversation with her where he doesn't, like, pick up a chair and throw it across the room. As a writer, it is completely bonkers to me and I think he tries to play it off later like well I was always attracted to you but I was like I'm sorry if that happened to me and my work got lost because my laptop got smashed I would just spontaneously combust <laughs> I would not be like a happy cogent understandable person able to have like then kind of like a meet cute conversation it would not happen no if you can get past that, like I said, it becomes very clear that Violet and this man, Matt, have a connection, even though Violet is a very happy-go-lucky, you know, extrovert, people-pleaser, and Matt is just very much, you know, grumpy, you know, grumpy cinnamon bun, essentially, is his character, believing the worst of himself at all times. So after this disaster, Violet makes it to her apartment in Rome, and they are being hosted by a Italian fashion um, professor, designer, and they are at dinner at this house and the professor says, oh, and you all have to meet my son. <laughs> and of course, in walks Matt, they realize that they are going to have to spend this entire time just two doors away from each other, even though at this point, they really are just having a really hard time being pleasant to each other and at the same time Violet has to give her energies to this internship and making her own five-piece collection to win this competition. So this is a single POV romance and I've been reading a lot of those lately and it's not intentional. I request these arcs and based on their plot and I like the plot idea and then I get into it and I'm like oh it's a single POV because it's not really something that is very often like advertised. I would really like to get back into reading dual POVs because I think at this point I'm just I'm feeling a little bit cranky about it and that makes me uncomfortable talking about this book because I feel like the single POV weighs very heavily on how I feel about the way that this book plays out. The only POV that you get is Violet's and that's fine. She's really the one with a lot more going on than Matt does. She's, you know, in a foreign country. She's um, struggling to get through school. She's feeling like imposter syndrome. She has the competition. She um, is still kind of dealing with the fallout of this long-term breakup that she's had. So there, there is a lot going on in her life. Because of that, I feel like this book ends up instead of being like a romance novel that is also about things happening in Violet's life, this is a book about the things happening in Violet's life that happens to have a romance subplot. And when I go into a book thinking that it is a romance novel, that is not the way that I expect. Again, it doesn't make this a bad book, but if you're looking for something that's very, very heavy on the romance plot line, it's not this book. That's one of the ways in which I feel like the Lizzie McGuire movie parallel is apt, not just the setting, obviously. I mean, at one point she even is at the Trevi Fountain, which is a whole big part of that movie, but also how like the Lizzie McGuire movie kind of sets itself up as a rom-com and then it's really about Lizzie McGuire, like, you know, coming into her own. And that is really this book. I felt like it was set up to be a romance novel, but it's really the story of Violet, you know, coming into her own confidence and learning about, you know, she went into fashion because she loves it, but fashion is also a business. And those two things are in conflict, right? She wants to succeed, but she wants to do what she loves. And she really needs more confidence than she has. And it's really about that story with Matt on the side. Honestly, at different points in this book, I felt more attached to some of the side characters than I felt to Violet and Matt's story. Violet has a best friend named Marco who has been in a long-term relationship with a man named Damien who's back in the States and they are very much in love. That's very solid. 
And so Marco is just the absolute wingman for Violet. He really wants to see her happy. He has seen her through a lot of this ugly stuff with her ex. And so he is just like a wonderful human being and he's always so supportive and he's able to communicate and chat with people in a way that Violet sometimes isn't. He keeps her grounded. Um, and I just loved every time he was like on the page. And then the third person also with them that's in contention for this prize is Holly. Holly is a very young fashion designer who Violet has been trying to be friends with. She knows that um, Holly's really talented, but they've always like not been able to quite make it work. There's some weird like, it's just not working. And over the course of their time in Italy, Violet realizes what makes Holly tick and Holly comes out of her shell in a way that's really cute and beautiful. And Holly also gets like her own side romance going on. And I was like really invested in Holly as a character too because she also had like kind of depth to her background that made her a really interesting character. And again, because the novel isn't as focused on Violet and Matt as it could be sometimes, we have time for these side stories which I enjoyed, but again, right, detract from the amount of time this spends being like a romance novel in the traditional sense. I think the fact that Violet and Matt didn't get as much time as I wanted them to have together was just exacerbated by a good thing, which is that when Violet and Matt are on the page talking to each other, especially before they've admitted that they have feelings for each other because this is like a pseudo enemies to lovers. They're not enemies, but they just did not get off on the right foot, right? And especially before they admit that they have feelings for each other, they are just really, really good at verbal sparring in a way that Kate Bromley is just like really, really good at writing. So when they are having conversations, I just never want them to end because they're funny. <laughs> The way that their personalities interact are funny. They both can like have a different sense of humor that is really works really well together. So I love that. I loved when they were together on screen. I just felt like we could have used more of it since this is ostensibly a romance novel. I'm not going to spoil the ending obviously but I think even though I wish this book had taken more time with the romance I think that it does replicate in a much more technically well-written way the space and time that Kate Bromley was trying to build into that relationship and talk bookish to me kind of making the point that some things can't be fixed overnight or in the moment or with a kiss, right? Some things have to happen solo. Some things take time to heal. Some things take time to think over. And the way that it was written in talk bookish to me was really clunky. And I could see what we were trying to do, but it technically the way that it was put in the book was just, just really off. And the way that it's added into this book is just way more seamless. It makes sense. The flow of the text is not interrupted. And again, wish we had gotten a little bit more in the beginning to make the payoff a little bit better in the end. But I still think this is an author who does something really, really interesting with that concept that I don't see a lot of other romance novels try to tackle in the same way. So if you are looking for some armchair travel to Italy, this book is great at that. The Italian setting is fantastic. If you are a huge fan of shows like Project Runway or Next in Fashion, um, I bet you you will also really enjoy this because the fashion part is just not something that like is kind of like added in the background. They're like explicit fashion design and fabric and all that kind of stuff. Like when they go to mood, <laughs> there's a fabric store that plays a really, really big part in this, which I absolutely adored. So again, Project Runway meeting the Lizzie McGuire movie. I just think that you have to be ready for it to be more of Violet's story than a romance novel. And as long as you're okay with that, maybe it's exactly what you're looking for right now. I think that this is a great book. Just don't go into it expecting something 
very, very romance novel heavy because that won't be something that you find here. One of the most exciting things about this book to me is that the writing promise that I saw in Talk Bookish to me that wasn't executed as well is executed much better in this book. And I am just a huge fan of seeing authors get technically better as their books go along. I think that that's really exciting to see. So I'm really, really, really thrilled that it's here and it does make me excited to continue to read more of Kate Bromley's books, even if you know, they're not the best books that I've ever read, I don't think. I think that they continue to get better and that is plenty of reason for me to return to the next one. As I said in the beginning, this is an ARC review, so if you're watching this the day that it gets posted, this book is not quite out yet, but thanks to the publisher and Edelweiss for giving me an advanced review copy so I could get this out to you guys. And you can decide for yourselves whether or not you want to put it on a hold at your local library or your uh, local bookstore. And I guess really the only possible way for me to sign off on this review rather than my typical buy is ciao for now. <laughs>